Yeah, here pretty soon, so we'll get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our um, newest iteration of our Lunch and Learn Talk series. That um, Just a quick thanks to our sponsors at Bar Harbor Trust and the Island Fishermen Wives Association and Camden National Bank for helping us put on this, this series where we get to talk about a lot of the different issues that um, Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries works with and it just in general in fisheries that are that are going on um, in the fisheries in our communities in Down East Maine. And today we have a real treat. Um, we're gonna talk about some, a partnership that Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries is very involved in and a, and a big um, supporter of obviously since we're a partner in that. It's called the Down East Fisheries Partnership. And um, as we go through this, you'll see a lot of connections to the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries down here in Stonington, Maine. Um, and this really represents the broad um, group of, of and other NGOs out there that are really in the same uh, fight and the same long game that MC MCCF is in. And so today we've got um, four very distinguished present presenters um, and me um, to talk about this partnership that brings our organizations together. So it's the Down East Fisheries Partnership, how collaboration is helping nine partners strengthen our coastal communities and fisheries in Down East Maine. And with that, I will hand it over to Bob Wood, the director of the DFP, who um, lives in his job at the Sunrise County Economic Council and let him uh, kick off our presentation. We'll go through some other present individual presentations and have some good time for kind of a panel discussion after that. So Bob, if you're ready, you can take it away. Thank you, Mike. Just coming through loud and clear visually. Yep. Great, thank you. Well, Thanks to, thanks to all of you for coming. It's a pleasure to introduce you to the Down East Fisheries Partnership. Hopefully you've heard about us already, um, but if not, by the end of this uh, lunch and learn that we had the pleasure to present, hopefully you'll know a lot more and maybe even have a lot more questions that you wanna reach out to us and, and talk about, and that would be great. To talk about the Down East Fisheries Partnership, you, you really have to start at the partners. Um, because they, they are why the partnership exists and that's how we get all our work done. Um, the Down East Institute is the first of nine partners on the screen and I'll, I'll walk you through the others. Got the College of the Atlantic, Down East Salmon Federation, Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, of course, Manomet, Maine Coast Heritage Trust, Sea Grant, Maine Sea Grant in particular, Sunrise County Economic Council, and the Washington County Council of Governments. And, and um, you know, many of you might be looking at this and saying, wow, what a diverse group. Um, and it certainly is. And I think that's the first thing to really start with. The diversity of our group really is a function of what we're trying to do together. Um, and, and you'll see that as we go along, I hope. Um, we're looking at a really complex task in front of us, um, a systems level task, and that requires organizations and people uh, with lots of ideas and lots of different talents. So to start with the why, why we're together, as you all know, over the last 200 years, a lot has changed in our uh, fishing and our fisheries communities and our fisheries ecosystems. It really began at the start of, of uh, European settlement uh, with, with damming. Damming has transformed our ecosystems by blocking fish migration and, and in a few other ways. Here it depicts, this graphic depicts where the dams are built and when they were built. And as you can see, it's quite a transformative power when you start to block the ability of alewives, eels, and Atlantic salmon from migrating from the Gulf of Maine all the way to the rest of that connected ecosystem up to our inland lakes. It's another graphic to talk about why and the situation we're in. The gray line here talks about or shows you what the total annual harvest in pounds has been in Maine from 1950 to 2019, almost to present. The gray line goes up and down uh, quite a bit. It peaks about 300 million pounds, but there are a lot of, a lot of dives in between there. Um, and that's, that's just the simple part of the story. Um, the, one of the punchlines here is depicted by that dashed line you see. And, and that is what the harvest would look like if you took lobsters away. And that punchline is, if you look at say 2015 to present, there's quite a big gap there. So we are really heavily relying on a single dominant fishery. And that, that reliance would be even more stark if portrayed in terms of 
uh, the value of the fisheries. The bottom depictions are what, if you see those stars in the gray line, uh, we've, we've taken a look at what was caught at each of those periods. And the circles below have icons for different species fish species and fish species groups according to how many were caught in the year of that star, so 1955 through 2015. And the only point to make here really is, an, is, is what we've already seen. There's a much more of a reliance on lobsters and to some extent clams than in the beginning of the period when we were fishing for the very valuable ground fish which had collapsed um, and, and the more pelagic fish that they feed upon. But down east communities still remain the most fishery dependent communities of all of New England, um, and some of the most fishery dependent communities in all of the country. Uh, as you see in the, the table on the right, 45% of um, our occupations are related to fisheries in our down east communities. If you go somewhere really well known, like the, the Gloucester section of Massachusetts, that's less than half of that, 20%. And if you go down to Boston, it falls to seven. So that's why um, you can understand we came together with the vision of seeing communities sustain healthy fisheries and having fisheries support thriving down east communities. Our mission, which matches that vision, is to help restore and sustain healthy fish, productive fisheries, and thriving fishing communities. We finished a new strategic plan about two years ago. And in that plan, we defined four five-year goals. Those goals may last well beyond five years, but it's what we're focusing on in the lifetime of that strategic plan. And they are to restore alewives and other river herring, to improve shellfish fisheries and the intertidal ecosystem health, to strengthen and restore accessible, resilient, and sustainable marine fisheries, and to strengthen DFP's capacity for collective action. This is a little bit about how we do our work. We use a, a variant of what you call the constellation model. We modified it for who we are and how we do our work. And what I wanna point out in the blue circles, that's where we sit every month to talk as a large group. Um, those are the DFP partners. In the smaller blue circle is a partnership committee. So we formed a partnership committee with a few of those partners that change from time to time that help us move a little faster than the once a month meetings would otherwise allow us to do. The orange is where the work gets done. <clears throat> you, we mentioned the, the, um, the goals that we set out for ourselves. Well, we made goal teams and the goal teams is where people within the partnership and depicted in orange here, where people that aren't formal members, but are partners of our member organizations can come in on a topic or project basis or in general, where the real work gets done is talk about the problems and the challenges and how our various capacities and strengths can be combined in order to meet those challenges. So with that, I hope you have a better feel for who we are, what we do and how we try to do it. But now for what we do um, in terms of collaboration, I wanted to turn it over to a few of the partners. Um, we're gonna have with us Diane Tilton, Mike Tallhauser, Dwayne Shaw and Jacob Van De Sandy. Um, so why don't I kick that off to them and, uh, and I'll see you on the other side when you have questions, perhaps. Diane, are you with us? Hey there. Um, I am not Diane Tilton. Uh, I'm Kyle Pepperman. I work here at DEI. Uh, Diane just came to me about five minutes ago saying that she had an emergency and had to run out of here. So I am going to stand in for her um, and uh, briefly speak. Uh, so Bob, I'm, I'm a little behind here. Uh, am I just talking about the muscle project or about DEI in general? So Kyle, Diane, Diane shared her slides with us. Um, but they were mostly about the muscle project. And the point of this uh, is to help people understand how the partnership helps the organizations get their work done. So if okay. you just like to, you know, wing it, uh, talk, you know, Absolutely. all about the partnership and the, and the muscle project, um, just give us a, give us a good feel for, 
your perspective on, and it's great to have someone who does the work, the scientists, the practices and works with the communities do that. So if you could just take a few minutes to talk about the, the muscle project and how it helps DEI. Absolutely, I'll share my screen real quick um, with the slides that Diane had prepared. Oops. Wonderful. Can you see that? All right, great. So uh, as I said, I'm not Diane Tilton. My name's Kyle Pepperman. I'm the hatchery manager here at the Downey Institute. We're a nonprofit organization with a goal of improving the quality of Maine and Down Easton coastal Maine through marine research, marine science education, and innovations in wild and cultured fisheries. Um, we run a uh, both a research and commercial shellfish hatchery uh, here on Beals Island. Um, we've been uh, going now for about 34 years um, since our inception as the Beals Island Regional Shellfish Hatchery. Um, and we are a partner in the Downey's Fisheries Partnership. One of the projects that we have going on right now is a demonstra demonstration mussel farm in Eastern Maine, where we have three uh, very small 20 foot by 20 foot mussel rafts uh, that are uh, being farmed by three commercial fishermen as sort of a, of a side hustle. And we're really looking at if we can commercialize uh, not only the seed that we grow here at the Downey Institute, but also uh, offer opportunities for uh, people to diversify their income streams through uh, these, these mussel farms. Uh, mussels are a species that grow very well in cold water that we have here in Eastern Maine. Uh, and we feel that it's a, a great opportunity for people to, uh, to take something new and run with it. So the overall goals here were, were to set out to you know, identify people who would be uh, candidate growers and select sites for them uh, or, and with them obtain LPAs, uh, limited purpose aquaculture leases through the Department of Marine Resources, um, install the, the rafts. Um, and on the rafts, we have a variety of different types of mussel seed. Um, they were all grown here at the Downey Institute in the hatchery. Um, two of the types are freshly seeded hatchery ropes, which um, basically look like used lobster ropes. And when they leave here, the mussels are so small that you really can't even see them. They're, they're less than half a millimeter uh, large. And then we also had some of this beautiful gold seed that you see in this picture here, uh, which we've developed uh, at the Downey Institute, um, which were averaging in the 45 millimeter range from a small farm that we had on the island uh, seed farm that were also put onto the uh, rafts as a larger size to uh, kind of get a, a jump uh, start on, on things. Um, and right now what we're doing, all the rafts have been seeded and they're out there in the water and we're assisting the growers with uh, monitoring of growth and survivorship with an ultimate goal of helping them to harvest and uh, market these, these animals. And we're going to be keeping a close eye on, on what we're spending and, and what we're able to make so we can uh, track our return on investment. Um, as far as data collection goes, we'll, we'll be doing an economic assessment um, with the help of uh, folks at e, uh, SEEC, um, looking at the startup costs to uh, gain entrance into fishery, uh, the farming costs of the day-to-day -day fuel, time, supplies, uh, something happened and we need to fix a, a raft that's falling apart. And then also, you know, what are the benefits? What, what, are, what is the ultimate return going to be for the farmer? And how can we get the most value possible for these really unique gold mussels? Um, because they are a unique color, we can differentiate them in the marketplace. And we can also market them as truly sustainably produced because they're all um, born in a hatchery and we're not taking animals away from other nature. And then what are the risks? Um, if you're looking to get into this by yourself, uh, you know, are you going to lose your shirt trying to get in and uh, have, have this as, as a side hustle? Um, and then as far as our, our biological data, we'll be looking at growth rates uh, and drop off, which is typically the main source of loss on a mussel farm. Uh, predation, we are uh, protecting the rafts with predator nets to uh, keep the eider ducks away from them, which are the, the main predator for a, a fairly large mussel. Um, how is crowding and, and competition on our lines? Are they too dense? Do we need to thin them out? Um, when we have a, a severe weather conditions, are we, are we losing? Um, animals, are the rafts that we built uh, staying, staying put and uh, relatively maintenance free or are there more maintenance than we expected? 
And then once we go to harvest, um, how are the, the processors uh, working, whether it's us processing the mussels, we're going through a, a for-profit uh, um, entity that already has processing equipment. And then, you know, ultimately, how do they taste? Um, and, and how is the, the, the meat quality? And how are they viewed um, by, by people who are going to be purchasing this product? And hopefully all of this uh, information that we gather will be used to uh, assess whether this, this looks like it could be a, a good thing for Washington County and fishermen in general uh, and be a viable uh, industry here. Um, so this is a look at uh, putting out the rafts on uh, one of our sites, uh, Butch Harris, who's a commercial fisherman. He's a, a nature guide at Down East Wind Jammers. He has a, a raft in the Penamaquan River uh, in between uh, Pembroke and uh, Eastport. Another one of our growers is Elijah Bryce, a young guy from, from Eastport, who's also a uh, commercial lobster fisherman, does a variety of other, other things, uh, including uh, getting started at a very young age in uh, kelp aquaculture um, off of Eastport. And then Jake Patron, who is uh, another commercial fisherman, um, and he also has a, uh, a kelp business um, in uh, Rokes Bluff, uh, adjacent to Roke Island. And uh, his raft went very close to where his, uh, his kelp lines are. Uh, so the ultimate goal is to put them out there, see what happens, and uh, bring everything back and, and uh, see, see what we can do. Uh, I'd like to thank Maine Sea Grant and as well as the Downey's Fisheries Partnership uh, and uh, private uh, funders for you know, making all this possible. Cool. All right. I think I'm next, right, Bob? Yeah, that'd be great. And thanks, Kyle. Thanks for thanks for pitching in and putting out that <laughs> yeah. fire. All right. Thanks. All right. Can you see mine? Okay. Can you see mine? All right. Okay. Uh, thank. Yeah. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate it. Hopefully, they get executive director salary for that last 10, 15 minutes. Um, so yeah, Mike. Thanks a lot. I appreciate the, to be part of this this panel. My name is Mike Talhauser. I come from the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. We're um, down here in Stonington, Maine. Um, a uh, big lobster port um, has been talked about before. And we're really, you know, you've probably been to some of our lunch and learns before, really focused on sustaining our communities and our fisheries um, and allowing them to, to be able to fish forever and, and sustain themselves as they have in the past. So I'm gonna go through just a, a couple quick sort of projects, focuses of, of Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. And um, one thing, our, our main focuses are in collaborative research, collaborative management, and collaborative education. And I guarantee you, if you have been to a lot of these lunch and learns, you've heard the word collaborative quite a few times. And so I really wanted to point out or kind of show you in some of these slides just how essential that collaboration is to the work that we do. So my focus, and if you want to know more about it, we've got a whole lunch and learn on it, is about is really focused on collaborative management and the river herring fishery or alewife fishery. Um, and so what that means is it's taking the, the knowledge and the capacity and the responsibilities um, that's out there in a whole bunch of different circles. I kind of like to look at them, you know, in the top left screen, we've got state and federal managers, there's tribal managers that, that really are playing a role in that. There's NGOs, like the folks that are in this, in this panel and, and lots of others out there that are into this work. There's academic institutions, and then really important focus for our work is the communities and the fishermen that also have capacity and knowledge. And we really we call ourselves a border organization that tries to pull these different capacities and different uh, players together into the, I would call it relationship that um, that is what we view collaborative management. And I think that's our organization is sort of based on the fundamental that that's the best way to to create these sustainable and um, and and really good fisheries management practices, and so this is just a, <clears throat> something kind of looking at that graphic. In collaborative education, uh, we do a lot of collaborative education that isn't um, really focused in schools, but we also uh, run a, a, a program called the Eastern Maine Skippers Program that works from the Penobscot to Eastport in nine different schools. We have around 100 students. Um, and have for several years. And it's really focused on creating the next generation of community members and fishermen 
and the focus is, is mostly uh, we call it on the water at the table and in the water or some uh, Little Mermaid fans call it under the sea. Um, but these focuses are basically, you know, on the water is looking at fishing practices, at fishing safety, and at just what you have to do to be able to come home at the end of the day. Um, at the table, a lot of that work is on how a fisherman actually participates in fisheries management from public working sessions to um, even the business side of, of a fishing industry. We've got students coming out of high school that are um, making more than their teachers did in the, the year that they left. And so that, that importance of how to be a, a small business owner is a big piece of that. And then in the water, understanding that the ecological and biological side that scientists and managers are looking at too, and being able to come to this process of collaborative management at more of a, an equal playing ground. So that's our collaborative management kind of outlook. And then we've got these big programs um, that are really broad. And one of them, the sort of flagship, I guess you'd call it, is called the Eastern Maine Coastal Current Collaborative, which is a, a partnership at its core with MCCF and NOAA and the Maine Department of Marine Resources, but really um, is this broad um, goal of developing a research framework that supports ecosystem-based fisheries management. And again, there's a whole other lunch and learn just on what that means, but it's, it's looking at, you know, not just all the critters and how they interact with each other, but also into the social pieces of our communities and that sort of patchwork of values that exist there, not just 40 miles out into the ocean, but 40 miles inland and trying to put those all together. So it's an ambitious goal that you can imagine isn't something we can just tackle on our own with the information that we have and the understanding that we have of all this work. And none of those, you know, the, the river herring co-management, the collaborative education, for this to really go forward, it requires, you know, partners geographically and with just a various, you know, list of skills and, and again, capacity and, and knowledge of what's going on out there that we need to bring together to really understand this and make these different collaborative efforts um, go as far as they can. So that's, I hope, just an overview of, of why this partnership of economic resources and monetary resources and understanding of different fisheries and land uses and all the different things that go into sustaining our communities. So that's why MCCF is a part of this partnership and is committed to seeing it uh, succeed. Thanks. I think Jacob's up next, right? Yes, indeed. Let me see if I can share my screen. All right. So yeah, my name is Jacob Vandy Sandy. I'm a project manager at Maine Coast Heritage Trust. And I'm calling zooming in from uh, our office at Whiting Corner on the shores of Cobscook Bay in the Orange River. Maine Coast Heritage Trust is a statewide land conservation organization, and we focus our work primarily along the coast. You can sort of see in this map we this coastline where we we do most of our work for the past 50 years or so. Back in 2013, we were doing strategic planning. And one of the things we identified is if we were really gonna achieve our goals, which are, which are to conserve the ecological, cultural and economic values of the communities on the coastal Maine, that maybe we were, uh, we were work looking a little too narrowly and that the rivers are a really important part of, of the ecosystem, the culture and the economy of this region. And then maybe we, we might need to change the way we do our work a little bit. So we started a, a rivers initiative. We looked at rivers statewide and, and but you know, coastal plain rivers, not the Penobscot or the Androscoggin or others. Um, and you can see from this map, our initial, the three rivers we were working on were the Orange, the Narraguegas and the Bagadus. Um, but we realized really quickly that if we were really to achieve our goals around these rivers and, and, and these larger goals around these communities, that we were gonna need to look at it more broadly. And that's, and that's where the Down East Fisheries Partnership comes in. I mean, we're very focused on land conservation and we on the coast, but we've moved inland. But we realized that if we were really to be successful long-term, we had to take a bigger look. And you can see the map here from the Down East Fisheries Partnership area. So 40 miles in, 40 miles out, we were, you know, we were going to have to address all of these things in some way. We're going to need to look at these wild rivers, these productive estuaries, and near shore marine habitat. And, and how are we as an organization going to do that? 
and the Downeast Fisheries Partnership was, a, was an obvious solution. We, you know, we started this rivers initiative and we have some experience in land conservation and we've been when diving into, into fisheries restoration and stuff, but we really wasn't where we had a lot of expertise. And so the Downeast Fisheries Partnership offered an opportunity to collaborate with a group of partners who really have skills in this realm and really um, communicate with them regularly and, and seize opportunities. The same is also true in the estuaries. Maine Coast Heritage Trust has been very focused on, on conserving estuaries, this important habitat, salt marshes, particularly in light of, of sea level rise. Um, so we've, we've done that work, but we had limited experience in sort of intertidal science and management. And so some of the organizations, Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, Down East Salmon Federation, have been really versed in that. And there's an opportunity again to learn from the partners in the group, Down East Institute, and, and to share opportunities and collaborate on funding and resources. Um, I think where this, this group becomes really important to us is when we look offshore. You know, we're, we're a land trust. And so we're focused on land, but we're talking about something else here. But it's very clear to us that what has supported these communities culturally, economically, ecologically is, is the ocean. That's why, that's why we're here. That's why these communities were here. And as, as Bob pointed out at the beginning, ground fish were an important part of what drove this economy and what brought people here to begin with. And if we're gonna be able to tell this story, that this, this sort of holistic story about why we need to maybe remove a dam to return elwives, we need to talk about ground fish and make the case that we're working towards restoring ground fish so people see the benefits of restoring fish in their own communities. And so again, we need help from this group to, to, to tell these stories. We need, we need to you know, be able to make the case that we're really addressing the big picture and that, and that we're gonna be able to make this stuff happen. So we need the group to tell the stories. We need their expertise. And then for me, the, the most important part of this collaboration has really been sitting at the table with experts, people with tons of experience, um, in a diverse range of, of, of roles that, that support this work. So meeting with Dwayne and Mike and Bob and Diane on a regular basis enhances, moves our work forward in, in ways that we wouldn't be able to do on our own. So I think that's, that's sort of, that's what the Downey Fisheries Partnership does for Maine Coast Heritage Trust and, and hopefully what we, you know, we then bring to the group itself. Thanks. Excellent, Jacob. Thank you very much. Wayne. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. And uh, thanks to all of you other presenters here for the great slides and the information. And the, the group that I'm representing is the Downey Salmon Federation. And the work that DSF does is focused on sea run fish. And you've just heard quite a bit about sea run fish and their role in the environment and in the ecosystem in terms of feeding um, potential cod fish and haddock and halibut and all of that. And on the inland side, they have a lot of uh, functions as well and keeping the ecosystem running the way it's um, run for thousands and thousands of years. And, I, and the Salmon Federation is working on Atlantic salmon, which are endangered, but Eastern Maine has a, the last really stronghold, but it's really more of a toehold in terms of Atlantic salmon themselves. And what, in looking at Atlantic salmon, we've, we realize, you know, something's broken here. It's not the salmon themselves, it's the way in which they're, they're being managed. And if you look more broadly across many of the fisheries, you realize the system's broken. While these fisheries are so critically important and our communities are so uh, deeply tied to them, the management is really not, an, at par with really where it should be, and hence the communities are struggling as well. Here goes the Harley. Uh, so what we believed was necessary was to join in coalition, um, particularly with the other 100% fish groups. So Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, Downey Institute, Downey Salmon Federation, that's what we do 100%. 
is fisheries restoration, recovery, management, and so on. And then we we partner with so many other organizations. We needed to have conversations, solid conversations. So we needed a new form. Thinking along the line that fun, you know, form follows function. So if the state and federal agencies and the municipalities and so on, the management wasn't functioning, which I think could easily be argued it isn't and it hasn't. Um, we need a new form, and the new form is via collaboration with NGOs who are, like Mike said, serving in this boundary um, place. So we we work between the communities perhaps uh, individual landowners, certain industries, and the state and federal agencies. So that's one of the forms that seems to be missing. And if we're going to put that into place, it, it's going to need some structure. And fisheries partnership allows us to create that structure, build efficiencies, know each other, be able to know better how to work with each other, and then to actually deliver on the ground um, results, which is uh, really more fish, more clean water that results in more fish. We can all argue down the road about whose fish are they, and how many we're going to harvest, but we need more fish. And clearly these ecosystems could be pre providing a lot more than what they are if we manage them better. So that's why we felt it was so important to help create this and then to really throw ourselves into it. And fortunately, um, we've had a number of um, foundations, grants that have come in that we've gone after in cooperation with each other. So part of building a basis for operations is finding the funds to do so. And um, going together, trying to paint a bigger picture of what we're actually trying to achieve, we believe is going to provide the funds that are necessary to put real base of foundation under these um, grassroots organizations like Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries, Down East Institute, DSF in particular, who are really on the ground um, doing the work of planting clams or meeting with scallop fishermen or meeting with the alewife harvest um, committees, rebuilding fishways, all of the things that are necessary to to sustain our very important economy. And you know that someone won an election, and I can't remember, was it Bill Clinton? It's, you know, it's the economy, stupid. Um, well, if, if the economy in Eastern Maine is tied to fish, well, it's the fish, stupid. You know, we've got to focus on the fish. The economy is tied to it. What is it going to take to manage these, these uh, fisheries over time and to, and to really recover? Um, the goose that laid the golden egg. And that's that's been the history of this region for many, many years. And I think, you know, we're doing it. It's much slower than we would hope. Um, but together we're we're painting a bigger picture. And you know, people talk about one plus one equals three. And and that's what we're trying to do here is to say we all need clean water whether it's for drinking water, for our fisheries, we need uh, ecosystems to function properly in order to sustain fish that have to get from point A to point B in order to be present and alive and available. So that takes coordination. It takes um, knowing each other. And, the, and that's part of what the collaboration has enabled us to do. Over now. Thank you, Dwayne. <clears throat> Mike, would you like to take us away on questions? Uh, yeah. Take, could you, uh, do we have any questions out here? I guess, oh, so here's one <clears throat> um, from Tom Howard. Um, how has the warming of the Gulf of Maine changed? How has it changed your focus and goals? I guess from our standpoint, I'll, I'll throw something out there and let, let folks um, jump in. Um, as he probably knows, the Gulf of Maine is warming faster than 99% of the world's oceans. And so 
I think it's just really put a bullet point on the fact that resiliency in the face of change is something that if we don't focus on, we shouldn't be doing anything. And so I think that adaptability, building that adaptability to be resilient in the face of change is just something that we can't take our, our eyes off. I don't, a lot of our work specifically hasn't changed in those core areas of collaborative research, management, and education, but building that adaptability to, to face that, you know, that big thing that's, that we all know is coming and we're finding out is coming faster than we ever thought was, is something that I think we all realized it was just a gut check of, we can't take our eyes off this. Um, people are shaking their heads. I'll let you guys jump in if you think of anything. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to that, Mike, if that's okay. Um, I, I think it doesn't necessarily, as Mike say, transform what we do, but it does shake up the priorities a bit. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of emphasis down east, <clears throat> excuse me. We've got some partnership collaborations, for example, uh, to help communities understand what it might look like to be more resilient and to adapt. Um, same with our fishermen. Uh, crabs, clams, for example, the green crab seemingly is becoming um, much more powerful as a predator on clams with warmer winters. And so what we're doing is working with communities to take a look at how they manage their clams from the shellfish committees to the, to the clamors. We're working with the spy community as well to figure out what might work for them. We're looking at adaptation by planting clams at a size that's larger than the baby clams crabs of that year can eat because there's so many of them they can eat 99.9% .9 of all the clams that year um, that otherwise would settle in the flats. So if you plant them a little bit later with clams that are cultured by DEI and then throw a net on top to protect them from other predators and larger clams, you now seem to have an answer. And that's adaptation. That's maybe where the fishery has to adapt. So we're looking at you know, shifting our priorities in a way that help towns and, and fishermen, including clam diggers, understand um, how they might accommodate these changes that they can't stop. I would, it's, it, it's interesting thing about the partnership is we have a variety of partners. And so, it, so that question affects us all differently. You know, I would say from the land conservation perspective, it really just, it, it encourages us to redouble our efforts because this, you know, the work that we're doing around conserving the habitat is just, as more critical than it ever was, you know, when we talk about climate change, whether it's forest or it's salt marshes. And again, as Mike said, the resiliency comes from that diversity. So the more fish runs that we can restore, you know, the more barriers to fish passage we can eliminate, the more likely these ecosystems are gonna, are gonna survive these, you know, changes in temperature and so on. Dwayne? Yeah, just a couple of quick thoughts. One. For the work that we do with connectivity of streams to the ocean allowing for fish to get back and forth so that they can fulfill their life cycles a lot of these impediments are also um, taking time bombs especially in light of climate change so from there's we've been able to add the human safety element into this public safety because a lot of these roads that are washing out um, are course a safety issue but they've also been known as impediments for fish passage for a long time and impediments to natural hydrology so we we sort of knew that this was coming but we didn't know how rapidly it would it would come so it enables us to, to say well you can get a, a twofer out of this you're going to um, improve your road management and safety at the same time you're going to get fish so that's that's a good really good pivot that we're able to do, um, which brings in a different angle toward the work. The other thing that people have said is, well, what are fish made of? They're made of carbon. If we could be pumping our carbon into our fish, well, that's a that's a great reuse of all that carbon that's out there in um, and in the terms of the millions of pounds of fish that we could be producing billions probably when you really look at it um that's uh, just something to consider one pound of alewife how much carbon is that but 90 percent of it is carbon or, or water but 
so that those are a couple of things that are just good to remember here. Thanks, Dwayne. I think I got I got yeah. one thing. Okay. One thing I was going to say is Bob took the words right out of my, my right out of my mouth about crabs and uh, and clam uh, interaction as far as climate change goes. Um, and and one thing that we're doing a little differently um, with the warming water is we're looking at different species that we can grow in eastern Maine. For instance, starting demonstration oyster farms in unused lobster pounds, um, which you know as the water warms, the oysters are going to grow better here. Um, and looking at how we can use aquaculture to sort of fill the gap um, that may be left open should our wild clam populations decrease and look for some way that people can, you know, be resilient in, in the face of, of our changing world. Great. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. And <clears throat> I guess that just as people were talking and kind of responding to that, I think it shows kind of one of the beauties of this partnership is that, you know, this is, you know, somebody threw out one issue. I mean, granted, it's a big issue, but we, we could all talk for hours on most topics that anyone could throw out there. And those different perspectives and views of, of these issues really puts together a, a, as complete as I think we can story of what those issues are and where all the angles are that we could really use to tackle them. And I just, it's, it's, this is one of those great things about working as partners is we get all those viewpoints. Dwayne, you got something else, another viewpoint. Yeah, I just wanted to draw one little story together between the sea run fish and the shellfish. And that is observations recently that we heard about in Harrington of sturgeon showing up in areas where nobody had ever seen them before. So no one alive, the clam diggers, who we we know well, are starting to report to us because we're a thin fish group. What are these fish jumping out here? What are these marks we're seeing on the clam flats? We put, put it all together and realized these are sturgeon that are here, not known to typically have been here over the last hundred years, probably coming there as a result of dam removals elsewhere where they're reproductively doing much better. But the, you know, one hanging question is what are they eating? Potentially green crabs. That's it. Hey, hey uh, Kyle, can you talk a little bit about, you know, that transition between a species not doing so well because of climate change and then a species that can't quite live and survive and thrive here because it doesn't warm quickly enough and what you guys are, you know, craftily doing with, with lobster pounds and your experiments there? Yeah, so, you know, with climate change, there are going to be winners and losers. Some things are, are going to have a harder time of uh, living, reproducing, um, and then some things are, are going to thrive that never have before. Um, so we're going to see, you know, species shift in, in this warming environment. And um, basically, we, we've, we found out uh, through, you know, people that we work with that there are all these lobster pounds around the state that really aren't being used anymore because the lobster pounding industry is, is not as profitable as it once was. And, you know, to us, it's like, wow, what an opportunity for aquaculture. It's a site where no one should have a problem with you getting a lease. There's no navigation in a lobster pound. Uh, most of the times the lobster pound owner is the riparian landowner. So it was just such an opportunity. Um, to, to get this piece of water and this infrastructure that used to make someone, you know, a, a bunch of money and now is just costing them money. Um, so we've set up a, a two demonstration oyster farms here on Beals Island. Uh, we also have a partner in Stuben that has uh, jumped in and started a full scale oyster farm. And uh, so far, it's looking like it's going to be a profitable endeavor. And if you would have told me five years ago that we could have oyster farms in Washington County that would be economical, I I wouldn't believe you, but because the water inside the, the uh, lobster pound warms more than the water outside because it's retained and it, and it gets uh, heat from the, the land and the sun, uh, it creates an environment that is attractive to American oysters. And as most of you probably know, there's, there's an oyster boom in Maine right now. And we would love people in, in the Downeast region to be able to take part in this. And oysters is just one example. Um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different um, species that we could be growing here from, from shellfish to kelps um, that really could help diversify our, our marine resources in, in Eastern Maine. Thanks, Kyle. Uh, one, one question is, how can community members and interested organizations get involved and assist in this crucial work. I guess, I mean, I'd start by saying, you know, 
looking at the, the Down East Fisheries Partnership website, there's, and it's not just our, um, you know, four or five organizations, there's, there's others out there. And starting, you know, looking at those partners and seeing which geographically are closer to you and, and are closer to maybe your, where you feel like you have capacity and then start connecting with them. Um, Bob, you're the coordinator, so maybe you have something more than that. Did you hear my virtual cough? I was on, <laughs> I was on mute. That wasn't a hint. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I guess I'd, I'd say that, um, you know, one of the really interesting ways you can help is that is by getting involved. The Down East Fisheries Partnership is going to be more, um, more involved and engaged in holding community level meetings. We call them convenings on a variety of topics because we appreciate that one solution can't work for each and every fishery, fishery dependent community we have on the coast. And that's one of, the, one of the things we'd ask you to do is keep an eye out for advertised opportunities to come talk about whether it's aquaculture or what you can do with alewives um, or a fishing issue or to help share with us and then with NOAA and DMR what you think about how the fisheries are being managed and what you're concerned about in the context of what Mike already introduced, the um, Eastern Maine Coastal Collaborative, so that ecosystem-based fisheries management can get a foothold here in down East Maine. So getting involved, staying abreast of events with our partnership organizations. And I should say, we're starting a new um, revamp of our website. And one of the goals is to help funnel you to those events and to those activities of our partners. So stay tuned with that. Um, and then you can always, um, I gotta mention it, you can always donate to some of our uh, members, many of which depend upon your donations to move forward from year to year to year. Great, uh, looking at some of the other um, questions. Um, let's see, I'm interested in how partners see the value of down coastal wetlands as sea level rises. I think Dwayne and Jacob, that's in your kind of crosshair is probably more than most. Go, go for it, Jacob. I'll yeah, I mean, I, I think it relates to what I said earlier is that, you know, we've been involved in, in salt marsh work, you know, protection for a long time as, as the Downey Salmon Federation, but the, the climate change and sea level rise has certainly reinforced the importance of that. And we've, we've created a, a, an, an initiative within our organization to try and address sea level rise and salt marshes. So it's not just about protecting the salt marshes themselves, but also sort of a riparian buffer. So we have to protect inland. If they're gonna rise, we don't want there to be houses there that then need to be hardened. So Mart, we have our Marshes for Tomorrow initiative to sort of focus on, on protecting the marsh salt marshes in, in different regions in the state and, and the upland buffers around those marshes has become really important for our work. Yeah, I could just say in, in terms of marshes that are already impaired, um, this region has two of the biggest opportunities in the entire Gulf of Maine for salt marsh restoration. Never mind sea level rise itself, but, but to open up a, almost a thousand acres of salt marsh that are behind tide gates that were built 70 plus years ago to, to allow for farming on those marshes. Well, we know now how much the ecosystem functions of salt marshes in important to our fisheries and for flood control and so on. Um, these are big debates, big infrastructure projects, and uh, there are feasibility studies underway right now. So that's in the Middle River in Machias, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in Addison on the West Branch of, of the Pleasant. And a number of us have been working collaboratively around that, helping the community to understand the issues at play, and then um, working sort of landowner by landowner around their particular issues. And that's multi um, uh, faceted in terms of the types of capacities that we need to bring to bear there. It's everything from septic systems that are built in a salt marsh to fisheries issues and so on. So it requires collaboration. I think Dwayne raises a good point that much, much like fisheries, and connectivity issues within fisheries and water courses. Our, our salt marshes have been heavily impacted by past agricultural practices and then, and then damming. And so in the same way, if we're gonna be 
prepared for climate change in the future and be resilient. What, we're, what we've learned over the past 20 years is the diking of marshes, the, ch the, the channelizing of marshes, the draining of marshes has created situations where they're less resilient to sea level rise. That there are these areas where the water doesn't drain and it sits there and then there's not vegetation, which then captures sediment and helps the marshes grow over time. So connectivity of marshes is, is just as important as it is for fish in that, in that sense to, to be resilient and to be ready for climate change. We need to address that as well. So it does appear that, that not only are we gonna have to protect them, but we're really gonna have to get involved in, in restoration as well to really look at physical changes like, like removing a dam or a culvert. There are those same, the analogous in the marshes that need to be addressed if we're gonna really see them thrive. There are a couple questions about alewives and the restoration by by David and 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 recently by Heather um, and and I'd like to share just a quick perspective on that. So David asked how how's the recovery going, and Heather asked um, how's the removal of dams impacting our work on coastal fisheries. Um, as every one of the experts of our partnership here today and 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 the rest of the partners can tell you. The alewives are a really remarkable fish. They're very resilient. They can come back very quickly, but they also have their limits. You know, the St. Croix watershed, river watershed seems to support as many as 40 million fish. Right now, um, we've had an uptick. We've had an uptick uh, to about 600,000 fish in the last couple of years. Uh, these are river herring counts, which are mostly alewives. And the reason we had an uptick is because while we had in the 80s, 3.5 million counted at the Milltown Dam in the St. Croix, sometimes uh, bad policies happen. And, and there was a policy to shut down the ladder at the dams on the St. Croix. Um, based upon information we now know, uh, probably wasn't the wisest decision in all ways. Um, and so they're starting to recover, but in the end, they'll still be limited. Dams are imperfect. Um, sometimes they're important, sometimes they're needed by communities but they're imperfect. Fish ladders are imperfect. Um, and, our, and our watershed still isn't you know, what it was before dams started getting built. So it's a long haul, but they're resilient. Uh, and there's lots of good news. Dwayne or, or uh, Mike or Jacob, did you wanna add something to that? Well, we, sure. often, think, we often think about alewives in their adult form and, and how many of large alewives come back into a river, but it's important to remember how many babies they create that go out into the ocean. And they're, as people say, born to be eaten. And when they, they leave and they go out into the bay, something's going to eat them. And um, the more of them we put out there, the more of those larger fish will come as a result. So it's, you know, it works well for both ends of the, the ecosystem. Yeah, I think we're all seeing um, alewives doing a lot better than they had. Dwayne's got a great point that, you know, we'll see runs of, you know, 300,000 fish and think that's great and see all those adults, but with each of those pumping out, you know, 500,000 eggs that end up actually successfully turning into little fish that fill our estuaries, it's pretty mind boggling when you think of, of that resource out there. And just really quickly on one of these success stories of, that has a lot to do with a partnership here. Um, on the bag of deuce where Jacob Bandis and he said there's a focus area from Maine Coast Heritage Trust. Well, that just happens to be kind of in our backyard on the Blue Hill Peninsula here at MCCF. And it's been, it's kind of been my focus area of really kind of getting in the trenches with these local managers and people monitoring and counting fish. And, and even, if, you know, when they can show that they have sustainable populations and have given up enough data to the state and federal government to be able to harvest those fish, we just, um, are putting the kind of finishing touches on the last two streams that we're restoring to fish passage and are on the verge of opening up an entire drainage back up to fish passage. And it's just this huge success story that we're both seeing that wouldn't have happened if um, managers from Maine Coast Heritage Trust and from our organization, and that also work with this, you know, the parallel work at DSF and other places um, as part of this partnership if that wasn't there, you know, this kind of ground up success story wouldn't be where it is. And it's really a model for, for other, other drainages out there. We're getting uh, just a minute or two away from, from the end. Jacob 
Um, or Bob, do you have anything to add on the on the ale wave? I and mean, we could all talk about this for the weekend, but good. Thank you, Mike. I just wanted to thank everybody for your for your thoughts, your chats, and for listening and sharing, you know, this story with us, um, you know, about our communities and our fisheries, especially on a day where you could be outside enjoying the sunshine. Yeah, and there's some other questions on there. Sorry, we didn't get to everything. We never can. I would encourage you to reach out to Bob. You can find his email on the SCEC, the Sunrise County Economic Council um, website, and you can look Google Downey's Fisheries Partnership and find all of our organizations and links to our, our websites and to contact us. There's questions about you know our our opinions on certain things and and just a lot of how can we help and and kudos and thank you for everyone on here and uh, very appreciative of Bob. Thank you especially for um, goat roping us and wrangling us into to getting a presentation and and getting us together. Um, but folks can probably tell that when we get in a room, we can go on a long time talking about fish and communities. And it's it's what makes these, you know, oftentimes the partnership sort of meetings end up being drawn out and tough to see what the value is. But um, when we're all in a room together at these at these meetings, goal team or stewardship meetings, it really, you know why you're there and why these partnerships are important. So thanks, Bob, for, for putting this together. I appreciate it. Thanks to all of you. Thanks, everybody. And thanks everybody thanks. for coming and um, just a quick kind of end slide if you want to learn more about MCCF and our lunch and learn series here's some some um, contacts here and again thank you so much I appreciate it and we'll see you at the next lunch and learn stay tuned to, uh, to see what our next topic is.